Right. So last time we um, we continued to have two thousand applications. We did uh, trust analysis, and the day the lecture before that we did beam. So let's today do some frame analysis. So we will take like an hour from now doing frames, and maybe we do some slab analysis. So what we have here, just like a um, simple frame that uh, has a tie in between its leg, and also it has like a shade or something, okay? So it has dead loads, it has live loads. We need to define different load patterns for each one of them. Uh, we have different sections other than the previous time. We only had one section. So we have column C1, we have beam one, we have tie. So we have to define all these different sections. And it's a concrete frame. So all these is a concrete cross sections. So let's see how can we do this in SAP 2000. From what I see, the loads are in ton meters and the dimensions of the frame is 18 meter. And there's a three meter cantilever. So what we will do, we will go to SAP 2000. First thing that we do is new model. And when we hit new model, it will ask for the units. So we will define the units, we will check ton force meter, and then we will get to grids because grids helps me to build the model faster. Actually, what you can do, you can start plank model, and then you can define the grid once you get here. Like you can say, edit the grid and modify the grid, and you can put your grids, you keep adding, adding, but it's better if I do it from here and say new model and, uh, and start to define some grids that can help me to be more faster in building my model. So, okay, let's do it. So from what you see guys here on the AutoCAD file for our example, how many grids in X direction that can help me build this model faster? Two or three? Three, because I have a grid here, one, two, and three. So I will put on the SAP 2000, you can do two, but once you, start modeling, oh, I need another grid to start building it. So I have three grids in the X direction. How about in the Z direction? Can we check? We have one here, then two, then three, then four, and there's five. All of these points are in different elevations because this is three meter. Okay, so we'll put five and Y direction, I can put one. I don't need to because it's a 2D problem in X, Z direction. And the X direction dimensions, it asks here for the grid spacing. So let's see, we don't have uniform spacing, but we can start with 18 and three and see what we will change. So I will, I will put here 18 meter and three meter and then say, okay, right now, my views are X, Y plane. So what I will do, I will change them to X, Z so that I can see my model. And I need to change this because um, like it's 18 and 18, I need it to be 18 and three. So I will do right click on the screen and put edit and click on edit grid, modify grid. So I'll find here A point A at zero, B at 18, C at 36. I will change this to B. 21, because I will add three to the 18, so it will be 21. Here, I have 0, 3, 6, 9, 12. Let's check the AutoCAD. So I have 0, 3, 6, but before 9, I have 8. So I will change this to be the 9. I will change it to be 8, and this I will change it to be 9. And then I will hit OK. And then... Okay, here, so you will find your grid has been changed like this. So right now, my grid is ready to put the geometry. But before I do the geometry, I need to define the sections because, because my problem has different section types. I have columns, I have ties, I have beams. So let's define these sections. But also to define sections, what you need to define before sections. Material, right? So here's the sequence. You define material. And then you define section because you assign material to each section and you use the sections to build your geometry. So let's do them step by step. So here I go to define material and I have only concrete material. So I will go to this one. I can modify it or I can add a copy to this material. Let's copy this material and call it FC40. 
And then the uh, material grade, the concrete grade will be 4,000 bound per square inch. And the weight per unit volume, it's 2.4. I can keep it. I can keep the model's elasticity unless you will change your material. So if you have um, high performance concrete or high strength concrete, so you will keep it changing. There's some lightweight concrete actually that you can use the weight per unit volume as a 1.8 or 1.9 or there's a heavy concrete that has high cement ratio that can increase the density of the concrete. Also the strengths can keep changing. Like as I told you in towers, we design with different materials. So keep eye on this, I will keep it 2.4. I'll keep the model's elasticity the same, the Boisseau ratio the same, uh, specified concrete compressive strengths, everything the same, unless we will be using different material. Then I will say, okay. Once we define the material, we are ready to define sections. So I will go to frame sections and I will add new property. And I'm, most of my properties are concrete. Uh, all of them are rectangle sections, but with different sections dimensions. So let's define columns. I have a column C1, dimension is 25 centimeter by 100 centimeters. So I'll come here and I have the depth one meter and the width is 0.25 meter, which is 25 centimeter. And I will call it C1, 25 by 100 centimeter. And then I make sure that I will check my material, which is FC40. And then I will say, okay, so here's my first section. Let's add another property, or you can add a copy of this property and keep it changing the names. Like I'll say beam P1, uh, 25 by 150 centimeters. So 25 by 150, so it will be 1.5, this 0.25 centimeter. And then I make sure that I check my material and everything is good to go. And then I will say, okay. And the next thing is to define the tie. Make sure the tie here, you see, what is this? This intermediate hinge, okay? So this tie is 25 by 150 centimeter. So I will go back here and add a copy of this. I will keep the same material. I just change the name to be tie, tie 25 by 150 and 150, 25 centimeter material FC40. Everything's good to go. And then I will say, okay. So I defined the three different cross sections. Then the next step is to draw your geometry. So you will go to the draw and then you will pick draw frames, cables, or tendons. We are going to draw frames. Or you can do it from the outside, click on this frame and make sure when you are drawing, you activating the section that you are drawing at the moment. So right now I'm going to draw columns. So I know that the, col the first column here is, will go from zero to eight and another one go from zero to six. So I'll go and SAP 2000 and the grid will snap me here and same here, L is equal to eight. And then I'm done with this column. Should I draw a beam like this and then draw this column? You can do it. Like you can do this and do that and then click outside. Then you delete the beam, uh, sorry, delete the column section that assigned to the beam, okay? Whatever it's easy to you. Or you can like escape and then redraw whatever it's, it's much, faster for you. And you know what? You can do something else. Like if, if, for example, this is what we draw and this is actually a column section. So I need to change it to a beam section. You can select it and go to assign frame, frame sections and pick the beam section, beam 25 by 150 centimeter and say apply. Okay. So you will find here that this column is C1, this is P1, this is C1. So there's different ways to draw and keep manipulating your model, like changing, putting. Okay, so I'm done with this beam. Let's uh, draw the cantilever beam here. So it goes up there like this until nine. Also, I draw it as a column. So I will select, assign, frame, frame section, beam one, and I'll say, okay. Then the last element, which will be the tie, I'll make sure right now that I have the tie activated and then I will pick it from here till here. 
Okay, so the geometry for my frame, is it ready or are we missing something? The restraints, the boundary conditions. So in the AutoCAD, I have hinge here and I have hinge here. So two hinges, so it's very easy. I will click on these two joints. I make sure that I select both of them and then assign joint restrain and then I put hinge and I say, okay. So I have two hinges here. So right now my geometry is ready to put the load on, okay? So I have loads on this beam and this cantilever. So I will select this beam and I have one ton per meter horizontally projected on this beam and life load one ton per meter. So before I assign these loads, I need to define that I have two different load patterns. I will keep it to the last. Yeah. I want to run this model without intermediate hinges and want to show you guys the results. And then I release them and then we see how the results will keep changing. Actually, I was about to ask you like when, once we are done, are we missing something? But you bring in the whole thing. <laughs> it's fine. Okay. So uh, anyway, uh, we will go to this beam and then assign loads, but first I need to define the load pattern. So I have dead load already defined and it has the self weight included, but we don't want to include the self weight because our problem is self weight free. So I will make it zero and I will say modify and the next thing will be live load. And then I will make sure that to select live load and also the self weight multiplier will be zero. And then I will add new load pattern. Two load patterns are defined and I will say, okay. All right, so this beam is ready to get loads. So I will select this beam and I will say assign frame loads and you will like click on distributed loads because we have distributed loads. Okay, the first thing I have is a dead load and it's in the gravity direction. Actually, you can pick Z direction. But when you say Z, you will have to make sure to include negative in front of your loads. But if you pick gravity, gravity means that is in the negative direction. But we have a special thing here, that the loads is horizontal projection. Like I'm saying here that you have one ton per meter horizontally projected. Like this load only impacts in the horizontal direction. So if you want to calculate the resultant of this load, you need to, see what is the horizontal that you have. So you multiply one by 18, and then you have 18 ton force resultant for this load. Okay, did you got this? If I'm not saying that this is horizontally projected, that means that all this load is distributed on the inclined member, which is the full length of the member. So the difference here that will make it in SAP 2000, that we will say it is not only gravity, but it's also gravity projected means that the loads will only projected on the horizontal lens, okay? So I will select gravity projected and the value of this load is one ton per meter for the dead load. So I will put the uniform load to be one and that's it. And I will say apply. So you will find your load like this. So that what happens here? So what happens, it is not one, it's not one, Right, it's 0.99. You know what happened? SAP 2000 take you one ton and distribute it on the inclined member and calculated the total value on the inclined member is 0.99. So if you multiply 0.99 by the total length of this member, it will be the same if you multiply one by e. Okay, so this is the difference between horizontally projected and non horizontally projected loads. All right, so uh, the second thing, you will keep this box activated and select this member again and assign live load. You will change this and make it live. It's one as well. And make sure it's a gravity projected because this is what our problem states. And then you will say apply. So right now, the table will change it from frame distributed loads from dead to live. Okay. So I'm done with this member. Let's get done with, with this member. So this cantilever has four ton per meter. It is not horizontally projected this time. I'm not saying it's, or it's on the entire member. And 
did load is four. So I will go to SAP 2000, select this member and make sure that this is dead. And this is four. And this is gravity only, not gravity projected. And then I will say apply. So right now I have the entire four applying on this member. And then uh, next thing, I will select the member one more time and change this from dead to live and make it three and make sure that it's gravity here. This is the live load. And I will apply this load and say, okay. So right now I put all my loads on my structure. So did I miss anything? Okay, let's run this model and see what will happen. Okay, I will deactivate the model, model analysis because we don't need it right now. And I only want to run dead and live load. And I'll say run now. Let's save it as frame three. Okay, so this is the deformed shape due to dead loads only. This is how the deformed shape look like. If you want to show the deformed shape for um, live load, you will click on this or you go to display, show deformed shape. And then you change this from dead to live and say apply. Okay, will be same thing. And let's get to internal forces. You can click on this and show internal forces on frames. And we need to see how the axial force look like. I will say apply. Okay, so this is the normal force. If you want to see the shear force, we last time or the first time that we explained SAP 2000, we said that the cross section has an X called three, which the moment is around and X Ax number two is where the shear at. So two, three, and one comes out of the member. So the forces in one and in, in, in axe number one is normal force, two is shear force, three is moment. If you want to show the moment about axe two, there should be forces outside of the plane. Like there's a force in this direction. All my forces are going this way. And my cross section is this way. So the moment is about axe number three. But to have moment about X number two, you need forces out of the plane to make moment in this direction. Okay. All right. So this is the axial, this is the shear force. Let's show the shear force, something like this. Let's show moment M33. All right. So right now, this is the moment M33. But if you came here, and put your cruiser, you will find that this element has some moment. And it should have zero moment because it's it's uh, like a truss member or a tie or a link member. Since you have intermediate hinge at this location and intermediate hinge at this location, this tie only can take normal forces. So there's some, there is a problem. What is this problem? Because I didn't release the moments at the end of the tie. So what should I do is I need to unlock my model. And if you recall from last time, I select the member and say assign frame and you and, and under frame, you will select release and partial fixity. And I will release moment M33 at the start and, and the end of this member. So I'm telling SAP 2000 that this member has zero moment at the start and the end. Release the moment, it doesn't take any moment. And then I will say apply, okay. And let's run the moment the, the the problem one more time. Okay, so right now, done. If you put the cruiser here, let's so here it says that the moment here is positive, here is negative. And if you put the cruiser here, there is no moment, the moment is zero. You can click on the member like right click like this member it will show you how is the shear and a moment and every at all the cross section on this member so if you if you try to move this way it will tell you that this section has shear moment this value bending moment this value if i did it for the column it will be something like this but if i did it for the tie everything is zero 
So right now my model is fine and everything's good with it. So does anybody have any questions relating to modeling frames on SAP 2000? Okay. The next example that we have today is to model slabs, slabs and beams, like a 2D grid system. So let's assume that we have a building and this building has a dimension of 15 meter by 15 <laughs> meter. And it has this distribution of columns. So there's a column each five meter. So I have columns here, column here, here, here. The span of each one of these is five meters. And we have uh, uh, beams on the perimeter of, uh, of size 25 by 70 centimeters. Let's see how can we model this on SAP 2000, okay? All right, so let's start a new model. And let's say file. New model. And how about if we change the units to be kilonewton meter? Okay. So for this example, how many grids in the x direction? And how many grids in y direction? And z direction? One, just one. I just need one. Okay. So I'll come to SAP 2000, and here I'll grid and four in X, four in Y, one in Z. And I know that the X has five meters spacing and Y have five meters spa spacing. Z, it doesn't matter. And I'll say, okay. So here's the grids that will help me to build my model very fast. So the next thing is to define the materials. You'll come here, define the material, and I will go with the material of 4,000 pound per square inch, and I will keep it. Second thing I have, two different sec sections. I have frame section and area section. Why? Because I have frame section for the beams. So this beam, all of them are 25 by 70 centimeters. And I have a slab and the slab will assume it's 20 centimeters in thickness. Okay. All right, so let's define the beams first. So we'll go to SAP 2000, define frame section, frames, add new property, and then concrete. Rectangle, B1, 25 by 70 centimeters. Make sure that this is only the name. It doesn't mean that you named this beam 25 by 70, that the SAB will, like somehow will know that the beam is 25 by 70. You will have to put the dimensions here. You will put here 0 0.7 and here you will put 0.25. This is how SAB 2000 identify the size or, and the, or the dimension of your beam. And then make sure that you are selecting the right material. It is not a steel. Because if you mistakenly select a steel material with a cross section 25 centimeter by 70 centimeter, this beam will have a deflection of like almost none because this is a very, very stiff beam. Okay. All right. So I make sure it's concrete. And then I will say, okay, I have my various element which is a beam 25 by 70 centimeters. Uh, then I will go to define the next section that I have is an area section. Do you guys remember when I, we talked about the area sections, how many elements that we have to, that we can use to model area sections? Like three or two lectures. Um, three, right? We have a plate, membrane, and shell. So the membrane is, something that can take tension, take compression, and take moments out of the plane. Like you have a wall and there's some loads coming this way that can make out of plane moment like this. But plate is something like the, the slab that we are sitting on, something that can take moments about X, moment about Y, and can take forces in this direction, okay? But wall cannot take forces in this direction. It's merely designed to take forces in this direction. Yeah, it does, but it's it is not a step in this area, but it is a step in this area. The shell takes the advantage of the membrane and also the plate. Okay, so it takes all of them. That's why we will use uh, we will use shell to model all our sections. So we don't mind like, oh, is it membrane? Is it shell? 
is it a uh, plate? So we will put shell, whatever the loads that it's coming through this, it will, it's like a matrix and we'll put zeros if the loads didn't come in the ways that we said, like we said that this is a plate, but we are going to model it to shell. So it will put zeros in the other parts that take material loads, okay? All right, so let's go to area section. And here, area sections, and then we have shell, add new section, and we have shell thin, and I will call it slab 20 centimeters. And I make sure to put the thickness as a membrane 20 centimeters, and also as a bending, bending mean plate 20 centimeters. So it, have, it has both thickness. Because this is because like some slabs uh, can be whole block, and the whole block has different thickness and bending and membrane, okay? Because it has a blocks, the hollows that has different cross section. So I can consider full thickness as a bending, but I cannot consider full thickness as a membrane, okay? All right, so for our example is a symbol. So I put 0.2 and 0.2, and I, I will say shell thin because our plate is very, very thin with respect to the other dimensions. And uh, the materials is 4,000 pounds per square inch. And I will say, okay. All right. So right now I can start to draw my first element, which is a frame element, beam B125 by 70 centimeters. It's on the perimeter like this. Once I'm done, I click out and it click escape. So I'm done with the frames. If you want to draw the area, okay, you can go to draw, draw poly area. So this is a general poly area. Like if your area is not rectangular and you have to draw it point by point. So I can, uh, you can do something like this and keep drawing. And then you will have an area. But here my area is re uh, regular. So I will draw a, a rectangular area. And in this one, I will make sure that I have a slab 20 centimeters and I will click something like this until I come to the other point. So right now it draws a one plate that has dimension 50 meter by 50 meter. But I want to make supports here at these points. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to define divide this plate into pieces. So I will select the slab and I will go to edit edit area, divide area. And when divide, you will go to the search option, divide area based on points on this area. And I want to divide it at the intersection of visible straight grid lines. So mm -hmm. I'm going to divide, divide my slab at the grid lines. And then I will say apply, okay. So what I did right now, I divided the area such that it gives me points to put hinges or put supports at it. So I select these points. I can select all the areas and I will say assign, joint, restrain. And at the location of the columns, I will put hinges because I will only do 2D analysis right now. I'll say apply, okay. So I put hinges and there is a columns at all the locations that given here. I have four at each line. Okay, so right now my geometry is ready to take loads. But right now I need to know what loads that this floor is going to take. First, what do you think that this floor has right now in terms of loads? Has its self weight? Has the flooring like carpet, uh, tiles, whatever the flooring is, and the life load. So you can go to ASCE 716 and define what type of loads that your structure has. So, what? Yeah, yeah, depends on your structure. For the residential, you will find a very large table with lots of things. It tells you if it's a residential. And actually, each part of the residential building can have different flat loads. Like the corridor is different from the room, it's different from the stairs, it's different from the balconies. So each part has different live loads. But I managed to get some values for you. So we will be using, um, let's define the load pattern first, then we put loads. Define load pattern, I'll put, oh. So right now I will keep the own weight because 
and this problem, this is a structure. So I don't want to calculate the own weight of all of these slabs and put them as a dead load. So I will let SAP 2000 put the own weight embedded into the dead load pattern. So I will keep it one. Once I say one, I mean like I'm asking SAP 2000 to calculate the weight of my structure and I sign it to this load pattern. If you make this 0.5, so what will happen? SAP 2000 will calculate the own weight and multiply it by 0.5 and assign it to this load pattern, but I want 100% of my of the slab weight, and I will keep it one. Or what I'm going to do, I'm going to add live loads, and I will make this zero, add, and right now I have dead on live. Okay, so next thing I will assign loads. I already have the own weight, so. The flooring load is usually depends on the type of flooring that you have. So if you have tile flooring is different from carpet, is different from hardwood. So let's put the flooring assign. Right now we are going, we know how to assign joint loads, frame loads, but right now we are going to assign an area loads because this will be a, a load distributed by meter square or per unit area of our floor. So I will have uniform shell because my load is uniform on my, on my area. So it will be something like this. And it's in the gravity. So you can say Z and with Z, you will have to put negative. Or you say gravity and just like put the absolute value because the gravity is going down. And the flooring, I will assume it will be one kilo Newton per meter square, which is a hundred kilogram per meter square. And then I will say apply. So right now, each one of these has negative 0.1 kilonewton going down. And so what, what did I do right now? So what I did, I asked the software to calculate the own weight and put it in div load. Plus this, put negative one kilonewton along with the div load because I didn't model the flooring here. So this is all these structural elements. But when you put, sand and cement and tiles on top of these. So we didn't include them in the, in the process. So what we do is we can lay them outside and put them as a dead load. So once we visualize the dead loads at the final, when we get results, so you will have the final results from the own weight and the flooring embedded in the dead load. If you want to only show the flooring, you can create a, a new pattern and put the flooring in a separate pattern. But we included both of them together. All right, so let me do this again. So I can define, actually let's assign area loads uniform and let's put this zero and then let's say apply. Okay, so I remove the load. What I can do, I can define load pattern and I will name it whatever like flooring and its type is dead, and I can't include the, the, the own weight in this load pattern, I will add, and then I'll say, okay. Then I can say, I, I select all my slabs and I assign area loads, uniform shell. I make sure to select flooring and I will put 0.1, sorry, one kilonewton in the gravity and I will say apply, I'll say, okay. So right now I separated the own weight from the flooring, but we can do a load combination and sum both of them together. Next thing is to put the live load. I will assign area load, uniform shell, and then I will make sure to check live and the gravity and the live load usually for residential buildings, it's uh, 1.92 kilonewton per meter square, and then also I apply. Okay, so I put live, I put flooring, I have own weight. So I put all the loads, my problem is ready to be solved. I will say run the analysis. I uncheck the model so it doesn't take much time. I'll say, okay. So let's see what will happen and if what we did is wrong or right.
Okay. So let's, let's check the deformed shape. So I will check the deformed shape due to the on weight, the dead load, and I'll say apply. Okay. Look at this. Does it seem like a realistic deformed shape for beams with the slabs of a system? Like the beams is deformed separately from the slab, right? So there's something wrong. This is not right. Does anybody know what happened here? All right, so let me tell you, for the analysis of slabs using finite elements, what the software do is identify, did anybody of you take finite element course? Yeah. Okay, so you guys definitely studied that you will have to increase the accuracy, you will have to define your element into more elements. Since finite elements only calculate stresses, strains, general forces at the joints. Look at here. I only have one big plate that has hinges at the force support. So there is no way that the software can calculate stresses or strains or internal forces here because there is no joint. Okay. So right now, the, the software is only seeing that this element has joint here, joint here, joint there, four joints. Okay. All of them is not moving. So they, the software interplay between the internal forces and the displacement between these two points. This has zero displacement and this has zero displacement. So what is the value then between the interplay between two and two? Will be zero, right? That's why this element is not moving. So there's zero here and zero here. If you interplay in between them, there will be zero. This is how finite element works. So to increase the accuracy in your model, you will have to divide this into smaller elements to create some joint in between the support. So that the finite element is clear, you can take them and calculate the internal forces and the deflections all in between these two points. Okay, did you got it? If you divide it more, then the accuracy will be much more. So I can divide it actually to one meter by one meter. So it will get values, but if you increase it to 0.5 by 0.5, you will get more accurate values. When one by 0.1, it will be much more accurate. This is how finite element works. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to divide this, like, let's unlock the model from this lock so that I can edit. And then I will select all my slabs and I will say, edit, edit area, divide area. And I will select the second selection, which is divide the area into object objects with maximum size of 0.5 meter by 0.5 meter. Say apply. And I'll say, okay. So right now I have a small mesh. Each one is 0.5 by 0.5. Let's run the model and see what will be the difference. Right now it takes much more time than the other problem because we increase the number of nodes. So it takes much more time to solve your problem. Look what happened here. So if you want to show the, uh, the, you start the animation for the deformed shape, right now the deformation is much reasonable. Like your slab is moving in harmony with your beam. Maybe, but it's much, much better like this. And this is actually a realistic deformation for a flat slab system, right? Okay. So this is the deformed shape. If you want actually to change the, um, like, let's stop animation. And you can, from view, you can fill the areas. Let's see. So right now, I want to. This is this is the moments on uh, display. The moment on frame. 
if I pick moment M33 and I say apply, okay. Let's Here we go. So here's the beam that we have. It shows the bending moment on this beam and this looks reasonable. The moment here starts at zero and then negative moment and the support and then goes up and down. And this bending moment looks fine to me. The second thing that we need to show is the shear. If you want to show the shear, you will go to frames and you will activate shear two two and you will be able to see how is the shear force is it changing. So it's something like this. And the new thing is that we need to know how is the bending moment on the slab look like? Did you guys take the design of reinforced concrete structure of flat slab systems, right? You didn't? You didn't analyze a slab system before? So what you do is that you take a strip and you see how is the moment look like on this strip, right? So, but here in SAP 2000, it is not a strip. It's the entire slab. So, we show the results in terms of control lines, and this control lines tell us how is the bending moment is truly changing with the beams. So let's go to display uh, show forces and stresses on shells, not frames. And then I'll say okay, and I will show it for dead load. And what we want to see for dead load, we we want to see M11 and M22. What is M11 and M22? So you have X1 this way in X direction and X2 this way. So we need to know the moment about one and the moment about two. So we will have here, we will, I'll check M11 and I'll say apply. Okay. So here's how the, the slab system will look like. Let, let me make it XY. It's something like this. So what, what is that? This is a control line that shows you the spatial how is the bending moment on the slab is zero, and then they just look, look at this, at this thing. Like it's a zero if it's this light blue. When it comes to multiple, it's it's much more. It will be well ton meter. So you'll have zero, and then it keeps increasing, and it's positive until it comes to twelve. This color. And then it keeps decreasing again until it comes to zero and then hit negative, comes to the negative side, and then keep decreasing. And it's a similar to the beam, like the beam the bending moment goes like this, and then this, something like that. Let me take a cross section and show you guys how is the bending moment is keep it changing. Like let's put this 3D, and I can from draw, I can select draw section cut. And I will make a section cut from this point to this point. Draw section cut. You will have to make this point, and you keep it. You keep your hand on the cruiser until you get to the other point. Oh, I didn't keep it. Okay, let's make X Y. Draw section cut, and I will make section. I'll make a section cut from here up to this point. That your line need to be straight, so that you can see how is the bending moment is keep it changing in this section. So what I did, I did, I cut this beam like a cake and see what's happening. So here's the bending moment. So it grows taller, and then turns out to be negative. And then goes positive, negative, and then positive. So that's what happened here. You can do the same here. You can do the cross section and see the bending moment. But actually, there is something about the bending moment. Can you see the bending moment is not as smooth here, mind you? It goes down and down, and then it's supposed to go in this line, this way, but there is a change in its motion. Like this moment goes very, very hard. And actually, this is not realistic. The amount of bending moment. Does anybody know what happened exactly at this location? It's because of the hinge, but actually we have a column. So what happened here is, it's like you have your slab on a needle. So there is a 
very high concentration of the stresses here that increases the bending moment of the that makes the bending moment very high. So this is not yeah, that, that goes bunching to you, but but it's a still like it's a what's going on? Okay. I thought that you are fighting. Yeah. No. Yeah. All right, so uh so we have a very high moment here, okay, which is not realistic because we have to count them, see this as a needle that has a very concentration of stresses. So what we do when we design, we need to define, we actually calculate the moment at the side of the column. So you will have to identify that the column size. I know that my column has two centimeters. So all these concentrations of expression are within the column area. And I know that my column is very, very simple to take this moment. So we calculate the moment at the side of the column right here. So if you design with a slab at the moment, the location will be a slab of five. 0.7 to 1 meter, which is a rack, not a stack. So this is not good. There is a software it's like SAFE. SAFE, you make your, your, your bin, and then you can identify a rigid area that can act like a column and calculate the moment much more accurately. So you will not have this problem. But we can't handle this problem. We will need designers. John, uh, like John, don't calculate the moment at the middle. They come here. At the, at the uh, like at the end of the column's edge and calculate the moment and design the slab for the negative moment at this location, right? This location. Okay, so this is for uh, the analysis of slab. If we want, if you want to take another section, you can draw a section cut and then we can draw another one here and see how the moment looks like. All right, so here's how the moment look like. Here, we don't have the, the problem that is here, because here we have columns that like play with all the stresses that we have and all the things that we have down here. It's reasonable, like the moment goes positive and then negative, and then positive again, negative, and then positive. So this moment looks reasonable. Does anybody have any questions on the uh, analysis of slab? All right. So if we are we are talking about like you have your slab like this, and then what what the sacri counter did, we, we make one joint as a support and we train this. But in real life, it is not a joint, it's a cross section of the column. So actually it's a 50 by 50 centimeters that has just training on the deformation. So if you want to calculate real bending moment, negative bending, you guys all know in the middle of in, in the middle of the slab there is a positive bending moment. On the columns, there is a negative bending moment. But the negative here is very, very high because it's it's a bin, right? So you will have like if, if I'm designing using SAP 2000, I will know my column cross section. So my example is 50 centimeter by 50 centimeter. And I know my dimension is 50 centimeter by 50 centimeter. So I have to come here at the middle and here at the middle. And uh, when I calculate the main moment of the slab, it will be it will be here at the middle. So let's see what is what is the difference between the two values. So let's zoom in. Can you guys see the numbers? So if you calculate the moment. Just on the top of the bin, it will be 40 ton, 40 kilonewton meter. Okay. But if you calculate the model, the moment here, it's 22. It's half the moment. Can you imagine if you design your cross section using the moment on the top of the column, you have to go, for example, five bars or six bars, let's say 10 bars. Okay. You design using this one. I mean, like if you design the slabs and you, your slab needs 10 bars. Design for this moment, this moment, which is half the moment here, you will only need five. See how much you save cost if you take this one? And if you think, oh, this is a slab, I know that there is a column in this area, but the slab is in the top of the column. And I need to design this slab on this moment because I don't believe in here. So if you will go this way and you want to design based on this moment, you will have to consider that the slab thickness at this location is infinite. 
Why? Why does that section here? Because it's a con. It starts from the first floor to the last floor. Like you have a 10 story building, so the slab thickness is 3 by 10, 15 meters. And if you calculate this, this is not will not need reinforcement at this point. Okay? But once the column ends here or here, so the slab thickness will be infinite. So that's actually the real thing. So the slab thickness here is 20 centimeters, but once you come at the column, it's infinite. Okay? So that's why you don't have to make the power at the concentration first. You have to come, and actually, I know some people can do it at C over Q from the column A. Okay, so it becomes C over C. I know I do slap thickness, so the slap thickness is 22. So you come 21 meter under this, under the column edge, and take the moment and design for the column. Okay. So this is for slabs, and this is the end of SAP 2000 tutorial. And this is the start of the midterm.